Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture video in genetics. So today we're moving into the next part of chromosome variations in chapter 8 here. We're looking at the significance of chromosomal rearrangements. So we covered the four different rearrangements types, uh, deletions, duplications, inversions, and transl translocations. Now we're going to talk about the significance of some of those in terms of evolution. All right, let's hop into it now. So here, a duplication again is where you know, you duplicate that gene of interest. So if that the dosage isn't affected in this, we so remember you can go check out the previous episode going over duplications where it could have a dosage issue. If it doesn't, that extra gene is free to mutate. So if that gene mutates, it has the freedom to do whatever it needs to do without harming the individual for the most part. So that freedom to uh, mutate allows a lot of possibility for those duplications. We're going to talk about two examples of duplications in humans that have led to different things today. Um, so here, again, this leads to genetic divergence in a protein family. So one protein family could have multiple similar proteins because of duplications in its history. Uh, one example here is human hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is made up of, so hemoglobin, again, is what carries uh, oxygen in your blood, there's an iron porphyrin ring at the center of each one. So hemoglobin protein is actually made up of four subunits bound together. Uh, two of these are alpha hemoglobins, and then two of these are beta hemoglobins, so subunits of each. And so we're going to talk about those. So this, this is called a heterotetramer. That's the final quaternary protein structure here for hemoglobin. And each one of these has an iron ring in the middle for carrying um, oxygen in your blood. So it has two alpha and two beta subunits. And now this is kind of, so I got this from the Evolution of Hemoglobin and its Genes, a paper um, from 2012 here. So this is, we're looking at millions of years ago, going backwards here. So this is most current right here. So about 800 million years ago, you have the vertebrate and invertebrate separation for here for hemoglobin. So Back then, there were, you know, we know of these duplication events that have taken place in this globin gene. Um, so here, it has made different globins now that are present, not only in vertebrates and invertebrates, but these different globins are present throughout humans. So humans have neuroglobin, myoglobin, here's beta globin and alpha globin. Um, so these two, again, are important for transporting oxygen, of course. Alpha globin even has two different versions, it has an, an A1 and an A2. So alpha globin here has already been duplicated in humans again. So who knows where that one could end up? We won't see the effects of it. Remember, this is millions of years here, 0, 400, 540, 800, millions of years. So it doesn't take place over one generation. Um, and we don't have to worry about this one in here, but it also is important for um, oxygen transport. But here, myoglobin, that's what stores oxygen in your muscles. So again, all of these very, very important. They all have come about that we believe from these duplication events of this original globin protein way back then. So one duplication of that globin allowed a branching here of two different subtypes then, and then further duplications and so forth. Now, this isn't probably completely, you know, filled in here. So there might be some missing um, branches along the way. So it all depends on what. You know, we're finding, and the way we compare this, we compare, you know, the different gene sequences with each other. How different is neuroglobin from myoglobin compared to how different are these alpha globins and beta globins? And those differences between the gene sequences we can use to create little historic maps of divergence like this. So if we uh, continue in this same paper here and focus um, specifically on alpha globin here. So this is focused, this table is presented via alpha globin. Just to understand this, how this is laid out, again, so this is looking at the evolution of hemoglobin and its genes. Uh, blue here is at the embryonic stages, so don't worry too much about that. And then here is the fetal and adult stages and all these different organisms over here. Uh, then here are the different numbers of alpha globin. So if we look at humans, there are two different alpha globins. If this is a P here, it's called a pseudogene, so it's a false gene, and it's not actually doing anything. So here, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the ones I just mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you go down through here, you can see chimps have three forms. You know, a vervet has two, baboon has one. I'm not going to go down through them all. Another thing I want to mention here, 
uh, rabbit, you can see uh, parentheses here with a three, mouse has a two right here, uh, rat has a three. So this whole sequence right here is found three times in this organism. So found two other places, and this one's found three, and this one's found one other place. So that, that whole gene sequence, that whole region is duplicated. So that's a more of a large scale duplication there for those. I just want to show how multiple duplications are found in just this alpha globin gene. So pretty interesting right there. So I wanted to mention that quickly. Up next here, a very, very interesting thing going on with color vision. Color vision, we think. So trichromatic vision. I'll explain a little bit more about coming of that here soon. But trichromatic color vision in OW is old world monkeys. So right here, we have old world monkeys versus new world monkeys for dichromatic vision. So these ones are new world monkeys. So these are NW, these are OW, if I use those abbreviations in the future. So old world monkeys, don't consider them old and you know being more historic, it's just how they describe them. Um, so trichromatic, so this is red, blue, green vision. So they can see more colors. Humans are trichromatics, whereas new world monkeys are dichromats. They can only see in green, and blue. So why is that? Well, we can look at the gene sequences and the chromosomes involved here to get a good idea of what happened. So vision is based on these opsin proteins. And all these um, figures here come from the EvoEd project at Michigan State University. You can go check out this link uh, here and learn more about it. Pretty cool how they put this all together there. Um, so here, opsins are these proteins embedded in the cones of your, your retina, and when a light pigment hits that, a light photon hits that, it changes it to change its shape, and that activates that vision pathway. I'm not going to get into the de details of it, but in humans, there are three different opsins in our cone cells, and that's what allows us to see three different wavelengths of light. <clears throat> so here, uh, there are three types, short, medium, and long wave sensitive. Um, so here, this is short wave sensitive, this is medium wave sensitive, this is long wave sensitive. And each one of these allow a certain wavelength of light to be seen. Uh, so here, you know, the colors of the rainbow. And the, depending on how they summate of each one allows us to see various colors. So if you have a light source right here, you get some activation of short wave sensitivity and then some activation of medium wave sensitivity. And our mind is able to analyze that as purple. So... Just a little example there, and these what these are what these opsin proteins look like. So of course, genes encode the opsins. So if we continue looking at this a little bit more, so the short wave sensitivity gene right here is found on chromosome seven, and the medium wave sensitivity gene and light wave long wave sensitive gene are found on chromosome X. Don't worry about the X too, just chromosome X. So the sex chromosome. If you ever remember hearing. Um, in a previous video, we talked about sex-linked genes, X-linked traits. Color blindness is an X-linked trait more common in males than females. That's because color vision here has a high prevalence on the X chromosome because it has both the uh, MWS and LWS gene. So where did this LWS gene? So dichromatics have the SWS and MWS, but not the LWS. So where could this have come from? We're talking about duplication, so that gives you a good idea. So what happened here, again, we're focused on the X chromosome now, this medium wave sensitive gene actually duplicated twice. There are two regions of that on the X chromosome. Um, don't worry about this one. This one didn't end up doing anything important. And then this one down here got a few mutations in it that let it create another opsin protein that was slightly different. And now that is able to activate photons at a slightly longer wavelengths or long wave sensitive. And because of that, it created dichromatic vision. So here that M medium wave sensitive duplicated and became free to mutate. It was free to mutate. It wasn't restricted by natural selection or anything like that. So here is the medium wave sensitive opsin, and this is the long wave sensitive opsin. This is just what the amino acid sequence looks like. And there are three key changes that occurred, three amino acids that mutated and created the long wave sensitive opsin protein. So now, before this, so here's uh, short wave sensitive and here's medium wave sensitive. 
so S and M, there was a little shift, a couple nanometers up, was this 30 nanometers difference, and that's a, a wavelength here, up to 564 for 534. Now we can see colors further up here in the long wave. Um, and that also extends down here. So if you have, if you're looking at a color right here, well, let's draw it down here at like 480 nanometers, this one activates at that amount, this one activates at that amount, and that one activates at that amount to produce that specific color. I'm not sure what color that is exactly, but that three different summations makes a more specific color. Whereas before for a, dry, a dichromatic um, monkey, there'd be no long wave one. So it's only summating two differences and that isn't as specific as a color for the brain to analyze. So the evolution of this long wave sensitive opsin allowed for better color vision. And that's important. Think about monkeys here for color vision. They're eating leaves and fruits and stuff and being able to observe whether or not a leaf is, or a fruit is ripe and ready to be eaten is a color dependent sometimes. So monkeys that are able to distinguish better leaves or fruit colors were able to survive and do better. Now, I'm just not saying there is, you know, a selection event against New World monkeys right now, but you can see how this could have taken over a population and been a significant change in that population. So here this divergence occurred. So here are all the New World primates and here are all the Old World primates. So humans are um, considered up here, and this is where color vision evolved and all of these are old world primates that have di or trichromatic vision. And all of these ones over here have dichromatic vision. Now, something weird could happen in these new world primates, though. There are some new world, new world primates that can sometimes have trichromatic vision. So, some new world monkeys have trichromatic vision due to that medium wave sensitive mutation mutating and producing a long wave sensitive allele at the same spot. So then you have an X chromosome that has the same mutations as the long wave sensitive allele. And that individual then, so this can only happen in females then, a female would have to have both X chromosomes where one is long wave sensitive and the other one is medium wave sensitive. So it has to be heterozygous. And now this female could have, remember this is X chromosome here, this female can now have um, trichromatic vision. So it's not impossible. <laughs> all right, moving on. These are all evolutionary significance of duplications. Next one I want to talk about here are the inversions. So remember, this is when it flips around. Now, inversions have some significance because when they flip, it actually prevents crossing over. So crossing over needs to find the exact gene sequences when it does that crossover event. So this prevents that from happening. So what happens is that, well, if crossing over does occur, one side might not work properly, creating um, non-viable recombinant gametes here. But this does have some significance here because it could maintain linkage of co-adapted alleles. It's always going to keep a certain sequence of genes together. It could be a larger group of linked genes because crossing over will never remove them from each other. So they stay together. So now imagine if that group of linked genes in that gene sequence was able to become more adapted to an environmental condition. Now, so here it's helpful for environmental adaptions of these linked groups. These linked groups now stay together and ensure the survival of that species. Now imagine if crossing over split those genes up and then you didn't have those adaptations staying together because of crossing over. You wouldn't get that. So one good thing about inversions here is that they can keep these linked groups together for adaptations for something like the environment. You know, not a lot of cases where that's happened, but it can maintain the, that linkage of co-adapted alleles. <clears throat> and next up here, or the last thing I want to talk about are Robertsonian translocations. Remember, a Robertsonian translocation is when you get an exchangement of segments of chromosome between non-homologs. So between chromosome two and five, they exchange and add the groups back together. And then a Robertsonian note is where the two knobs are lost. So remember it's, if we draw uh, two chromosomes here, let's draw this one a little bigger and we have two little knobs. So these are both acrocentric chromosomes. Probably should make these knobs a little smaller. Uh, two acrocentric chromosomes. These two pieces 
come together and these two pieces come together. So this forms then after the translocation, it forms a very large metacentric chromosome and then a very, very small one of just these knobs right here. And these ones usually disappear. So this reduces the chromosome number because of the loss of this chromosome here. Again, if you forget what the Robertsonian translocations are, go to the previous episode um, in, in the genetics playlist. So because of this, this could cause reproductive isolation of this individual if they don't have the correct chromosome number anymore, no longer creating gametes that are viable with its same species. Now, we believe this happened in the evolution of humans. So chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes. Human have four, humans have 46. And we believe chimpanzees, um, the evolution of chimpanzees to humans was a translocation event reducing the number of chromosomes here. How do we have an idea that this happened? Chromosome number two in humans. So right here are the human chromosomes. This is chromosome number two. Now, if we look at the chimpanzee chromosomes, they have 2A and 2B. Now, interestingly, our chromosome two is, let me draw this in a different color here. Let's go to green. This region on chromosome two and this region on chromosome 2B Actually, let me choose a different color for this one then. So this one's now blue. This one matches a lot of the genes found there. And the longer one matches a lot of the genes found here. So it's believed that there was a Robertsonian translocation. And then these two small red ones here, these knobs, also formed but were lost in the process. So that reduced our total chromosome number. Remember, remember, these are 46 total chromosomes or 23 pairs. This reduced us from 24 pairs to 23 pairs because we lost the knobs on 2A and 2B. And it's kind of kind of neat to think about that. So we reduce chromosome number during evolution. Uh, and here, if you're looking at where the insert happened, I tried drawing there, I believe it happened, the insert was right here. This is a showing a few of the different genes found in that insert region. Um, but yeah, so here, this would be, you know, chromosome, what do we say up here, chromosome 2B. So these regions right here would be 2B from the chimpanzee, and these ones are closely related to 2A from the chimpanzee, whereas those little knob regions were lost in the translocation event. So a lot of these highlighted genes here match 2A, and a lot of these highlighted genes match 2B. So that's all I want to talk about today, just a few cases where we think these chromosomal re rearrangements played a big role in human evolution. Um, so they're not always a bad thing. They're not always a good thing. They, sometimes they do nothing. A lot of times these chromosomal changes lead to abortions and the offspring are not viable. It's very important to have the right number of genes, the right dosage of certain developmental genes and so forth. But that's all I have for the rearrangement section. I know this has you know, gone on for a bit now. Coming up, we're going to be going into the aneuploides and the polyploides, which are different uh, types of chromosomal variations outside of rearrangements. But that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.